All right, so let's get started. And again, I'm really looking forward to this and I wanna thank you for being with us and being so generous with your time. This is a remarkable moment. And I'm actually quite hopeful because after having been in Washington myself for four decades, it's hard to imagine that. I guess I started when I was three. That's a lie. Uh, <laughs> and covered uh, administrations and so much news as a journalist. Uh, there is something very different about this moment. And it is both precarious, but it is very hopeful. First person we're going to hear from is a National Geographic explorer and a filmmaker. And he's doing an incredibly interesting and unusual project. And I want to invite him to the stage now. And there you are. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Frank. I'm so happy to be here. Thank well, you for. I'm delighted to have you. I think uh, in the in the in the in the um, in the in the arms race here, your books outnumber mine, so you win. Today. <laughs> I think we have like matching offices. It's pretty well coordinated, actually. <laughs> we did not choreograph this. And please note that I'll wear no jacket. Uh, John, you you've got an incredibly interesting project, and now you're going to be talking about this, but it's called Baseline. Uh, so in a word, what are you doing? Um, I'm trying to tell the story of the climate crisis on a longer time horizon. I'm trying to, to stretch our storytelling muscles, um, to go across long periods of time instead of just, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you talk about that, but just so the audience knows, John Sutter is a national geographic explorer. He's a documentary filmmaker. He is a, uh, an analyst and he appears on CNN a lot. Very, very influential, incredibly talented. John, welcome. When you're done, my colleague, Dr. Imani Cheers, will join you on stage and engage you in conversation and bring some uh, students and others in for some questions and conversation with you. So I'm going to step aside, turn the stage to you, and it's all yours. Have fun. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. And um, uh, hello, everyone. Like, I, I really enjoyed that networking session before, um, you know, before the presentation. Sim City to me, but it was so fun to get to chat with you know some of the people in the audience. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, give me just one moment. Okay, so as uh, you know, Frank mentioned, I'm um, uh, I'm a, a documentary filmmaker and a journalist who's focused on the climate crisis, um, and lately I've been working on this project called Baseline, which, um, like I said, aims to sort of stretch our collective memory and, and get us to think about time uh, in a new way with relation to the climate crisis. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that and, and about that sort of future leaning. Uh, um, okay. Before I do that, though, just because I'm a um, you know a storyteller by trade, I have to start with a story. So this is Lauren McClinahan, uh, who is an environmental historian at Colby College, which is kind of like a you know an interesting and a little bit unusual um, title. And basically, what she does is she looks back in time um, for visual evidence of the ways in which things are changing. Right, like the climate crisis occurs on Earth time across decades and generations and centuries, even. Um, and you know she's looking at environmental change in that way and she told me this story about um, some photographs that she found in a library in key west florida um so this is one of those photos it's from the 60s um and uh you know this is the thing that people love to do when they go to florida um maybe some of you are in florida um is uh you know to take a picture with their trophy catch um and sort of show off the fish that they've caught for the day you can see, again, she found um, this uh, from the 60s as we advanced forward through time because she found photos, um, you know, through the decades from this exact same dock. You can see that the fish start to shrink. And by the time we get to the 2000s, the fish are almost unrecognizable. You know, they were as tall as the people in the photos. And now they're the size of, I don't know, like a forearm, like they're, they're very tiny. Um, and so what happened here? Um, because if you look at the, you know, you look at this image, like the, the fishermen are still smiling in these photos. They're still happy about the catch. They haven't really noticed this change that has been occurring slowly. Um, and basically, you know, because of overfishing, um, uh, the, the size of the, of the fish have shrunk because too many of them have been pulled out of the ocean and the species are changing, right? Like some of them are, are depleted to the point that they're not being caught anymore. And um, uh, Lauren McClenahan and other fishery scientists, um, Daniel Polly was the guy who coined this term, um, call this phenomenon shifting baseline syndrome. 
And, you know, I know this is a little like um, wonky and academic, but it's basically this idea that environment takes place on a different time scale than our storytelling abilities typically and our alarm systems, right? So it, it, it's a gradual build, a slow turning up of the heat as opposed to like an event, a moment in time that we can recognize as alarming and then um, respond to. So in some ways it sort of sneaks past some of our alarm sensors. And as someone who's you know, spent years and years covering the climate crisis as a, as a journalist, um, this is really scary to me. Like I, I sp I've spent a lot of my, my career up very close um, to the climate crisis and, and talking with people who are um, you know, very much feeling the effects now. This is a photo from Honduras a couple years ago where a very intense drought linked to climate change was pushing people north. This is from the Marshall Islands, a country in the Pacific that, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is so low-lying that uh, it could be displaced entirely by sea level rise, you know, putting an entire culture, a language, a history, all at risk. And then this is from Puerto Rico. I was there for quite a while as an investigative journalist for CNN, um, uh, reporting on the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, I met a man who was living in this house for months um, after that storm without a roof. And so it's it it's it's scary to me to think that we would normalize these stories, or we wouldn't be able to fully grasp the magnitude of these changes that are unfolding in front of us. That we might be like those fishermen in in the photos. Um, of course, like we know uh, the the data, like we we and we have for quite a long time. This is Dave Keeling from Scripps in San Diego, who was among the first scientists to start like charting and measuring the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which, of course, is you know a result of our burning of fossil fuels, which acts like a blanket um, around the planet and and is causing things to heat up. That you know this is in the 1950s when he made this um, important finding. But, and so, you know, we have this like sort of intellectual sense that we know what's changing. We can plot it on a graph. We can like um, map it. <laughs> but I, I, what I'm worried about is that it, we don't feel it in our guts in the same way we do other emergencies. Um, and it doesn't translate always into our, into our storytelling. And I, I know that in part because of um, this researcher, Fran Moore, who's at UC Davis. Um, and she was very interested in this, this concept of shifting baselines and how people process like a really pretty simple question, um, which is like, is today unusually hot? Um, it, it's, it's hard to know, right? Like we're sort of bouncing on this trend line all the time. And it's hard to know if what you're experiencing day to day is um, unusual or not, because it's, again, this, this change that gradually build up, builds up over time. And she went to like what I think is a really fascinating place to try to answer this question. She thought, you know, okay, where do people complain a lot about the weather? And um, that place for her was Twitter. And so she analyzed tens of thousands of tweets um, about heat and came to the conclusion that our memories are only about two to eight years long when we decide whether we think a given day is unusually hot or not. Um, and that memory shifts forward with us through time, right? Which is that normalization process where if you're only remembering the last two years, um, you know, a hundred years from now, uh, what you think is normal is going to be very different from what we would think today, much less a hundred years ago. Um, and this is again, another kind of wonky chart, but it just shows um, like the perception in blue of, of, you know, how we feel about change in temperature versus the reality in red. And, you know, when you think about like our storytelling abilities, I think that they're failing us in some ways. Um, this is a newspaper front page from 1988 when James Hansen testified that the era of global warming um, had begun. If you really look closely at, at the conversation, some in some ways it feels like it's been going in circles and there are similarities that, that, that cross decades. Um, so I, I know that all of that is a little, I, to me it's very troubling, um, but I don't want to stop there, of course. I, I wanna talk about you know ways that we can stretch our thinking and try to get our heads around this massive crisis that we can fix. Um, and in my own like sort of quest to think about that, I decided to spend some time with um, scientists who already have a handle on this, right? They call it, um, you know, longitudinal research, the idea of watching something over time. Um, and I spent some time with this guy, John O'Keefe, who's at the Harvard Forest in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, decades and decades ago, just almost on a whim, 
he decided that he uh, really liked um, walking through the forest there. And that while he was doing that, that he was gonna take like super detailed notes about every tree and when it was, you know, budding in the spring, when it, when it um, leafed out, like he just knows these trees in this forest in a way that no one else does and has um, decades of records. And what happened while he was doing that was that the climate crisis emerged. Um, he started before it was really as known as a, a piece of science. Um, and you know his 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 note taking his walks in the forest became the most detailed record of the ways in which that place has been changing um, um, because of because of the climate crisis. Um, and again, this is called longitudinal research, right? Like following uh, a happening at intervals, looking very up close over a long period of time. And so that brings me to the project that I'm working on now, which is kind of stealing that idea. Of, um, of a longitudinal study and applying it to film or to storytelling. Um, and the premise of this project, which is called Baseline, and I'm working on Baseline Part One right now, um, is to follow um, children in four locations um, in five installments between now and the year 2050. Uh, again, the aim is to sort of stretch our collective memory and get us to try to think about the climate crisis in a, a new way. Um, I also see this film as like uh, a, a provocation in some ways, right? Like um, we are part of these stories and we are shaping the way that they will turn out. So the four locations, like each of them is um, chosen based on a different climate impact. One is Shishmaref, Alaska, where the permafrost is thawing and the sea ice is melting. Um, it's a village that has um, sort of toyed with the idea of a relocation plan or an expansion plan because the ground has become unstable. Um, Dominica, which is in the Caribbean, um, which was devastated by Hurricane Maria and is, you know, faced with the threat of growing storms. Um, Majuro in the Marshall Islands, um, which, as I said before, is um, seas there are rising and causing these um, uh, increasingly troubling floods. Uh, and then um, a town in Utah where uh, uh, everyone relies on um, a river that has been increasingly running dry. So again, these are these are stories where people are very much like connected to a sense of place, and I think are kind of they're the John O'Keefe's in a way, the guy in the forest, right? They're they're watching up close, and they have a sense of what's changing. And my hope is that they are sort of protagonists in helping the rest of us see uh, the truth about what's happening. Um, this is uh, Monty and his dad in in Utah. They're um, uh, ranchers, and again, therefore very dependent on. Um, the water supply there, which has been increasingly unreliable. And one cool thing we're doing is 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 it's sort of in enlisting um, the kids who live in these communities to help us document what's going on. So this is from a video um, that Monty took on horseback, like helping his family round up cattle. Um, and uh, again, I see them as important witnesses to help us. Um, put a story to that data trend line that we've known for so long and as an important um, provocation because I mean the truth is we know that uh, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for in the ocean systems for like about a thousand years right so knowing that can be terrifying and it can be paralyzing um, but I see it as motivating and as an opportunity because um, in a way we live in that future already because our actions do. Our actions today are shaping that world and our own world right now. Um, and so our positive decisions, if we're able to kick this and get off of fossil fuels and become uh, you know, a carbon neutral society, then those decisions and those, those actions matter for that long across this like multi-generational, huge like earth time scale that it's really hard for us um, to think about and to get our heads around. But I think um, with some concentration and focus, it's something that we definitely have the capabilities uh, to tackle. So um, thank you. Thank you for listening about this um, project. And I think um, now we're going to do some questions. Hello. Hi there. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Hi. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, um, John. That was that was phenomenal. I have, I have so many questions, and, and we have a little bit of time. So... I just want to encourage everyone, please use the Q&A 
um, uh, tab to put your questions um, in there. And um, I'm going to be filtering through. I have a couple of questions to get us started. But John, one of the things that really sort of stepped out to me um, and stood out to me um, during your presentation uh, was this idea of you know stretching collective uh, memory. I was taking like vicious notes <laughs> um, and your and your longitudinal research. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how did you pick the locations? Um, and I see Maddie in the in the general chat has the same question. How did you pick the locations as a as a filmmaker and storyteller myself? Um, I, I deal with a lot of in, in sub-Saharan Africa um, and, I, and the Caribbean. So I noticed that, um, you know, I'd just love to have you share a little bit more about how those four locations came about. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I mean, it, it, it took a lot of work. Some of it was based on where I had existing relationships. Because, I mean, this is in some ways like a, a partnership with these communities. Um, and mm -hmm. so places where I already had a lot of ties, like Shishmaref in Alaska, for example, I've been up there a few times, first for CNN in maybe 2009. Um, and so I have kind of longer standing relationships there, uh, the same with the Marshall Islands. Um, but it, I, um, I was super lucky and got this, this um, fellowship where I had some time to think about that question. And it was at a university where I could speak with a lot of experts, right? And try to weigh things, and and it's it's kind of devised around this idea of like what are some of the main impacts of the climate crisis. So we have you know like Arctic story is one of them, sea level rise is one, storms, and um, uh, and then drought in the case of the the story in the west, western U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so it's trying to represent that. It's trying to represent geographic diversity, racial mm -hmm. diversity, um, and they're mm -hmm. also an important thing for me was they're all places that are better than those of us in urban environments, I would say, at being connected to place, mm -hmm. where like place is inherent in identity and where like people are very attuned to the the micro changes that are um, unfolding. Um, I mean, in Alaska, for example, like there's this amazing tradition of passing names across generational lines. And so it's almost kind of like a metaphorical reincarnation where people who are gone are still with the village and so th that place has an amazing um like sort of cultural and environmental memory and i think that that's something that the rest of us can can learn from so that's a lot of it too um that's phenomenal john and i, I questions are coming in please do that and in a moment i'm actually going to bring up um two students who have and get some live questions and get them engaged um and even speaking of students i love that this baseline project focuses on young people. Um, as a mother myself, um, I have a seven-year-old son, and I, I do, I do wonder um, what, what, how is climate and climate change going to impact his lifespan? I look at and I think, you know, my grandmother is, is 94 years old, and then my son is seven, and I look at all the things that she's seen in her life and all the things he's seen in his short life. So I'd love to, for you to just share a little bit about how, like, why even choose um, children to sort of follow and tell this story to? And what do you hope is going to be the larger impact um, looking at this from, I'm assuming, 2020 or so? Like, it's a 30-year um, span? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, the the um, the the focus on children is, it's a couple things. Um, one is that, you know, um, young people have the most at stake in this crisis because they're going to live the furthest into it. So, that was kind of where that, that premise came from. Um, I also think it will be interesting to follow up with the same people, um, you know, through time and see how both the place is changing and how they're changing um, and how they're thinking about these issues um, evolves or shifts over time. Um, and I also just think it's like, if my idea here is to kind of like reshake our thinking a little bit and try to get us to think in different time scales and to think about the ways in which we're impacting our own futures and the futures of real people all around the world all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that yeah. kids bring like a freshness to everything that is that is that is nice and can help break through like sort of old thinking on on, on some of this stuff. Like it's it's amazing just to even see the videos that they're creating from like their eye level. You know, like the world looks and feels different mm -hmm. um, from that perspective. So that's part of it too. 
I um, I love that, and it's so it's so true as you mentioned in terms of having the most stake in the game, of course, and um, people who are going to be impacted. Um, I love the idea of looking at thirty years. Um, and then also giving them the power to tell their stories, right? Giving them the tools for them to document um, all the things that you and your crew, you know, might not might miss, right? What are sort of the day to day um, experiences? So adding all of that is just absolutely phenomenal. I love it. Um, we have some pretty good um, questions coming in on the chat. Um, and I am going to read out uh, one of those. Um, Jansen Bayer said, um, we got some votes on that. And following on that, what are some of the unique perspectives you have found in interviewing children versus adults? Um, have you, have you, are children more optimistic about their future than, than adults may be um, about theirs? You know, like it's, it's the, the beauty of, of naivete almost. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I'm like hesitant to do like total generalization. I think that there are, like there's an older couple in that village in Alaska who I know pretty well. And if you've lived, you know, 80 some years, then you've seen up there like very stark changes in terms of like when the sea ice is forming, a lot of the land has disappeared and like their neighbor's house fell into the water because the land caved. Um, and so they have, I think a perspective just in terms of like their life experience that is is different from a young person but i mean i find young people remarkably thoughtful and um and considered and i do think that they're aware of what's going on around them and often like deeply troubled by it and therefore motivated um I, you know i i like i said i don't want to be a pessimist here because I'm, I'm really not but i think that we do have to grapple with like the hugeness of what's going on and i, do, I think these kids are doing that Fantastic. Um, quick question before we um, bring up uh, one of our students, speaking of young people, but um, for those who are really uh, want to know, and this is a, uh, got posted, she has a bumped up in the chat. Um, how often are you going to be checking in? When, when can we see the first installment um, of, this, of this project? Yeah, we've been shooting the first installment um, um, just recently. Um, and so, I mean, it, it'll be it'll be a year or so before it's out into the world. The, the pandemic has frankly slowed that down just a, a bit. But, um, you know, if you go to baselinefilm.com, um, there's a newsletter you can sign up for there. And I, I post um, updates. And so you can, you know, keep tabs um, on that. I'm also JD Sutter on Instagram and um, Twitter. So you can kind of follow the progress, progress of the project in those places. Fantastic. I'm glad you, you, you saw that, that peg there I, I shot for you. So fantastic, John. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, Brianna Quintana. She has a question. Uh, Brianna, please turn your mic and camera on. Uh, Brianna uh, Quintana is a newly minted graduate of Northwestern University, where she studied journalism, global health, and Spanish. She is coming to us from her hometown of Palm Springs, California. She recently interned with the documentary film producers, producers Retro Report, and she will intern with NASA this summer. So Brianna, welcome. What's your question? Hello. Um, hey, so, my question, hi. Uh, so you said that you will use firsthand video footage from the children you feature in the series. Um, how do you think using firsthand video will contribute to um, discussion and action on the climate crisis? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it, it it's meant to center the perspectives of young people and for us to be able to see the world through their eyes. And I'm hoping that creates um, a sense of empathy uh, with communities that are really struggling with um, dramatic effects from climate change, like now, um, and um, and yeah, I, like I said, I think that in some ways the film is is trying to provoke audiences to realize those connections and therefore you know make changes because of it. Like um, the end of this film, like in 2050, it's not like the climate crisis stops in 2050, but it's at least trying to trigger a sense of thinking about the future that maybe we don't have when we see other stories, which is that, you know, you're going to be engaged with these communities for a long period of time and our actions are going to shape the ways that their stories unfold. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. 
Thanks for that fantastic question. Um, I think um, um, our time is actually uh, up, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but John, thank you um, so much. Um, and oh, no, I actually do, I am allowed to go to the last student. Yes, I'm checking my my behind the scenes um, text message in there. OK, fantastic. So we do, we have one more question um, and one more student to bring up. Um, so Kara Reagan has a question. Kara, can you please turn your mic and camera on? Welcome. Uh, Kara Reagan is a junior journalism and mass communications major in the School of Media and Public Affairs here at George Washington University. She's joining us from Bedminster, New Jersey. Um, she's a student and one of my colleagues, Lisa Palmer, is at SMPA. Um, so Kara, I'd love for you to share, what's your question for John? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, how do you think your approach to science storytelling through discussing the issue with children will inspire action at this point in time that a way other efforts to inspire action haven't done so thus far? Um, I think that um, I think that the main thing that makes this project different is the way that it's dealing with time, right? Like that it's it's provoking a longer term thinking, um, uh, like a stretching of collective memory. And I think hopefully by putting a finger on this idea of shifting baseline syndrome, which I, I do think is one of the major reasons that we're not doing more faster about the climate crisis, um, that that will be a wake up call for um, for people. So that that's my hope is that by seeing ourselves in the context of earth time, right? Um, it, it both, you know, like I said, at first, when you think about that, it can almost be paralyzing, but it's an incredible opportunity and responsibility that we have not only to kids who are growing up right now, but also to people who, you know, aren't born yet and won't be born for generations to come. And to me, that is like a very motivating push when you really understand the full magnitude of, of what's happening on the planet right now. Thank you. Um, that's a great um, actually answer to uh, in this uh, portion of our um, summit today. So uh, Kara, thank you so much for your question. John, thank you for all of your insight. I'm going to invite um, my colleague, former boss, uh, Mr. Frank Sesno back here, and um, I'm going to leave you all. Thank you so much, John. I can't wait to follow the project. Well, and Dr. Cruz, be before you thank leave, you. just let me remind everybody that you'll be at a table when we go back to our table and networking break little bit so you can visit up with uh, Dr. Cheers and with John Sutter, JG Sutter. I like that. Uh, and, and Rob, before I let you go, and, and we're going to have a really interesting uh, next bit here, uh, and we're going to compare your longer range view with the daily view um, of one very important question about how you're going to be incorporating science and how you're going to be using the science and the data as you do this over the next several decades. Um, so just very, very quickly, could you talk about that? Yeah, no, I think um, um, the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere and like global temperature, there will be a couple like data through lines that are are used to sort of orient us both in time in terms of the year, but also in like climate time, right? Like what what is the status of emissions? Where what's the status of the buildup of CO2? And the stories are all related to that point. So it is yeah. it is a very like, human centered project, but it, it it will have that contextual yeah. data um, so that you get it in the big picture. It's going to be really interesting. I hope the human centric product reflects the changing in the trends and the science that we're seeing. That's I'm an optimist. <laughs>